so let's let's get started today. I want to. We got a lot to cover. Where? Somebody mess with the light switches on the side to see if we can get these ultra light, ultra bright lights on the screen to go away. Okay. Uh, while we do that, nice. Look at that. Magic. All right. Great. So let's talk. So we talked last week about stack overflows, and we saw how a stack overflow can work. But now our main goal is, and as some of you have probably found in your uh, on assignment four, right? We want to see well, how do we exploit a stack overflow, right? So assuming that we can control and modify the saved instruction pointer on the stack, how do we actually get that to execute code of our choosing, right? And so this is actually um, there's a lot of different techniques to do this, and they depend on exactly what type of architecture the system is running, right? If you think about it, um, right, you're trying to essentially inject some code into some other process and have it run, right? So this depends on what kind of machine this is. If it's a x86 machine, if it's a 64-bit machine, if it's an ARM machine. Um, and so this will depend on the assembly instructions, what operating system you're using, the specific stack alignment could create issues. And so this is probably the best. I think Gavin sent this out uh, on the mailing list. Uh, this is a great paper that can help you as you're going through and trying to deal with this stuff. Uh, smashing the stack for fun and profit. Uh, still, still a fantastic uh, resource. Yeah. I think you said you used an old TCC to compile some of that stuff. Yes. Uh, could you possibly put that on the server for us so that when we're going through this? They're on the slides and the server. I mean, it's not that it's an old version of GCC, it's that there's a bunch of flags that we use to, um, so we'll see in a few more slides, there's like the exact uh, command line parameters that we're using to compile these things. Okay. Yeah, so this way you can practice, you can use, uh, with those you can use all these examples to try to practice as well. Um, so the goal of this, so what we call, we call this code that we're injecting into this other process, uh, we call it shell code, right? And so the goal is we want to execute code of our choosing, right? And this is the entire point of trying to subvert this other application. And so, and the key point, right, as we saw, is that this code that we execute, right, has the exact same privileges as the vulnerable application, right? So this is how you're able to move up through the levels, right, because every level is a group set UID at the next level, right? So once you break into that, you have permissions of that group to that next group, and when you run the delete command, all it does is add you to that group, right? So permanently, so now you're permanently part of that group. And so shellcode is the term, standard term for this type of, of code. Uh, it's called shellcode because you're trying to pop a shell or basically execute slash bin slash sh. Uh, so why bin sh? Give us everything, right? We have an interactive, a beautiful interactive prompt that we can type in commands just like you have in your command line, but now that command line is executing as this uh, user with higher privileges. And really, uh, so shellcode is kind of a misnomer at this point. It's really just assembly code to perform some specific purpose, right? If you're attacking a web server remotely, you don't really want to run bin sh, you want to do something else, right? You may want, uh, there's all kinds of other stuff. You may want it to drop a file, you may want it to steal a file, you may want it to uh, open up a reverse shell, so connect to you on your system, on your port, and run a shell like that. Uh, there's all kinds of cool ways to do this. So we're gonna look at building some shell code from scratch to execute bin sh. So, in essence, this is what we want our shellcode to do. So we have our main function. We have some character array. We want the name, the name zero, so the first argument of this character array to be bin sh. We want the next one to be null. 
and then we're going to call the, C, the Linux syscall execve, right? So what's execve going to do again? System call. Do yeah, it's a system call to do what? Do run the bash, do run the command. Yeah, so execve is going to take this first uh, character pointer, right? Execute that command, look up a, a, a command bin sh on the server, and then it's going to pass as the second one the argv vector, right? So here the argv vector, argv0 is going to be bin sh, and argv1 is going to be name, uh, null. And then finally, what's this last one? It is null, yes. <laughs> end of arguments? Uh, at the end of arguments is specified by this null as the name here. So this is a null terminated vector of character pointers. Uh, this is the environment. So this is the new environment. Remember when we exec processes, they inherit our environment. And we can change the environment. Uh, here, by specifying null, we're saying it has no environment. So, what is exec going to do under the hood to this process? What is the operating system going to do when it gets this call? Let me check 
EAX, the value in EAX to see which system call to call, and then it finally goes and transfers into the exec DE function. Okay, and the exit, just for completeness, so the exit is a lot simpler. Uh, the exit is value one in EAX, so the syscall table, this means one in EAX means exit. Uh, we put the exit code, this status code that we want to exit with in EVX, and then we call in AD. And so this is how we're going to build up this exit. So, what we need to build this shell code. So we need a null terminated string slash bin slash sh somewhere in memory. Right, so what does it mean, null terminated? Yeah, null value bin, right? Slash bin slash sh, null. Right, zero. That's what we need. So we got to have that string somewhere in the process, process's memory. Then we need the address of that string somewhere in memory, followed by a null pointer, a, a null byte, or sorry, uh, a null pointer. So it'd be not a byte, right, but a whole null. And this is going to be our argv parameter. And then we need to have the address of a null word somewhere in memory for environment pointer. So our steps basically are going to be for our shell code. We're going to first copy B, which is 11, into the EAX register. We're going to copy the address of the string bin sh into the EBX register. Right. So this is just putting what we want to do with the um, those definitions of the syscalls. Then we're going to copy the address of the address of bin sh, right? Wherever bin sh is into ecx. And finally, we're going to copy the address of a null word into ebx. And then execute in 80. And then we'll do our cleanup. We're going to move 1 into eax, 0 into ebx, and finally execute in 80 again. So we can write some shellcode that does exactly this. So we can write some preliminary shellcode. So we're going to do it, we're kind of going to refine our shell code step by step. So here we have in the data segment, we have a label called sh, which is the string slash bin slash sh, uh, followed by integer zero. Uh, so here's my text segment, so here's my code, and the global means that export main is a symbol, so main is going to be the this way the linker knows how to call this when we compile this. So in main, we're first moving 11, which is the same thing as B, right, into EAX. Then we're going to move dollar sign SH into EBX. Is dollar sign SH a constant? Right, so it's going to be the compiler is going to uh, or maybe the linker is going to replace this sh with the address of this string slash bin slash sh. So this is going to be done by the linker, as we'll see. Then we're going to push 0 onto the stack. Right. So this first part, right, moving sh into ebx. So now in ebx is the address of sh. But now we need to create that array, right? We need an array whose first, who has a zero followed by the address of this string slash bin slash sh. We're going to use the environment pointer for that. Uh, luckily, we have a nice handy way to store and uh, save values. So we're going to use the stack for this. So we're going to first push zero onto the stack, right? That's going to be the end of our array. And then what are we going to want? Next on the stack, the address of the string, yeah, sh. So then we're going to push sh. Now the stack pointer, what's in the stack pointer is the address of this address of sh followed by a zero, which is exactly what we want. So now we're going to move the stack pointer into ecx, right? So this is the argv parameter. And then uh, we're just going to move 0 into EDX, right? Because this is null, so we're just going to move 0 into there. And then we're going to call in 80. Right? So this is going to be a software interrupt. The kernel's going to handle everything. Then hopefully, if everything went correct, what should happen? 
Yeah, we should have seen as if we executed slash bin slash sh, right? Um, but in case that didn't happen, we'll move one into eax, move zero into epx, and this is the same thing as calling exit zero. Any questions on this? Yeah. Just once repeat the push part. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually pretty cool. So the idea is Yeah, so the idea is we need an address to an address, right? So argv is going to be, argv0 is the, is, uh, argv is a variable length of, a uh, variable number of character pointers terminated by null. So the first element there is argv0 to our program. So, So the idea is, so we have our strings, right, slash bin, slash sh, followed by, uh, I don't remember what this, followed by zero, right? We have this string in memory somewhere, right? Based on this code, we know this is going to put that string here in memory, and it's going to give it the memory address sh. So here, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm moving this memory address into EDX, right? So that's pretty straightforward. So this is that string. So I, for exec VE, I pass in a string, right? So exec VE, the first argument is a character pointer. So I just pass in the address of a null terminated character array uh, for bin sh. But now what I'm doing is I'm pushing. So if you think about the stack is here, right? So ESP points, let's say here, right? Now when I push zero onto the stack, right? That's gonna be 32, 32 bits of zero. And now the stack pointer is now gonna to point to here. <coughs> right, and then I'm gonna put, so let's call this, uh, let's use alpha right now. Right, so we don't actually know what it is right now. So we'll say alpha is the address of this bin sh string. So the next line is push alpha onto the stack. Ah, <coughs> straight lines are difficult. Which now means ESP points to here. Right? And this points up to here. Right, so now I'm going to move the stack pointer into ECX right at this point. Right, so in ECX, it's going to be pointing here. Right, and so our exec VE says, okay, the second parameter, right, the second parameter needs to be basically a character star star. Right, an array of character star pointers, which it's null terminated. So we need to put the address of slash bin sh followed by a null. So here, when we dereference this once, right, ECX0 is going to give us a character pointer, which points to the string slash bin slash sh. So this is going to be the first argv parameter. And then exec VE is going to say, okay, what's the second parameter? It's going to increment ECX technically by four bytes or one character star pointer or one character star. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to point here and it's going to say, okay, this is null. So this means there's only one argument passed here. Right? So argc C, when I execute this, is going to be one. And the arg V is going to be um, uh, the string slash bin sh followed by null. So we needed to see with the alpha, we could get alpha, right? The program's gonna give us alpha. It's gonna give us this address. But we needed this 
a pointer to that address, and that's what we're using the stack pointer for. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> slash bin slash slash goes into EBX. It also goes into EBX, yes. So when we execute a function, right? So exec VE is the file name, right? So that goes into EBX. And then argv, so what's argv0? The file name that, 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 that by convention, right? You could actually technically do this with null, but binsh executes a little bit funky if that parameter is null. Uh, and this is because it's usually linked to bin dash or bin bash, depending on your system. And that program will look at how it was called to try to determine how to behave. So we're actually just being nice here. Uh, but it shows a good kind of strategy here, how we can build up this thing using the stack. So does it terminate with a null, I mean a, a zero as well? Our, yes, our argv. In, in ECX, it terminates with? Yes, so it's a, it's a character, so the type here is uh, character star star, right? And so it's an array and it's a variable length array. So it says when you hit a null, which is the null here, that's when you know you've reached the end of the argv array. Oh, the null address, so the full zero. Yes, yes. So full 32 zeros. All right, so we saw this. And so you can actually compile this with GCC, right, as we saw with the uh, assembly code. Uh, we're using M32 to say we want it to be 32 bits. So this will compile just fine. And then we can execute it. And so what do we expect to have happen? Yeah, new process. It's just as if we called slash bin slash sh. Right? And so when we do this, it'll show us like this. Um, and it will wait for us to type in commands. So we can type in any command that we want. So let's dig in a little deeper to see how this works. So uh, after we compile this, we can use object dump, right, to see what exactly, how did the compiler compile our assembly instructions? Uh, so we can see it looks very similar, right? What's Maybe one thing that's changed. Yeah, right. So the linker replaced the dollar sign sh with 804961c. Right. So, but we want to. So, let's think about this. So, is this a good test of our shellcode? string literal as non-ASCII characters. 
And then I'm going to declare, OK, I have, so this is the way you declare a function pointer in C. So you say, OK, I have some function called shell. Then I'm going to set shell equal to the shell code. So this is going to copy the address of shell code into the shell. And now I'm going to call shell as if it was a program. Right? So it's under the hood, it's just going to call jump. Uh, it's going to say, actually, it's going to copy this into a register. And I think it's going to do jump to EAX or something like that. Um, so how, what are we looking for here? How do we know if this is going to work? Run it? Yeah, but what's our, what's our test conditions? Or our, uh, what, what, what's our hypothesis? What's it, how, do, how do we know if it's going to work or not work? <laughs> yeah, we got what we did before, right? If it pulled up the dollar sign SH 4.1. So you can compile this one like this. For this one, you have to have the dash z exec stack flag to make sure that it doesn't do an executable stack. But you can compile it. It compiles fine. You run it with a.out, and it does not do that. So it calls the exit function. So what was the problem? So look at our code. So what's the problem here? Uh, yes, exec is returning, yes, and then we're exiting, right, exactly, so that's what happened. But why did it fail? So why did exec be fail? The hard-coded value of the address. So what about the hard-coded value of the address? Uh, it might not point the bin sh anymore. Right, yeah, now we're inside a new program, right? Our old program is referencing the string slash bin slash sh specifically by this memory location. Right? Because the compiler made sure that at that memory address were the bytes slash bin slash sh0. Right? It made sure it was exactly there. But once we take this shell code and put it inside a new program, who knows what's at that, that memory address? Right? We're referencing some hard-coded address. We're executing inside some other person's process, some other program's process. So who knows what's at that memory location? So this should give you the hint as why this is the preliminary shellcode. Right? This is the first thing you write to make sure it does what you actually want it to do. So well, yeah, so what we these are the key problems here, right? So A, the first thing is bin sh is not lived in this code at all. Right? So bin sh may not even be in that program. So we have to introduce slash bin slash sh0 into that program. And and then we have to make sure that we can get that address. So what did we use to get the address of argv? Yeah, we used the stack, right? We used the stack to get the reference of it, right? We pushed the things onto the stack. Because we know no matter where that program is executing, the stack pointer is a pointer to a current location on the stack. Right? So why don't we use that same trick again to get a pointer to bin sh. So if we push slash bin slash sh0 onto the stack, right? then we can use the stack pointer to get a reference to that. Uh, so now right, we want to make sure, OK, now let's rewrite our shell code, but let's not use any data segment, because we don't want any hard-coded data in here. And so this is what we're going to do. So we have the main function. So we're saying we're going to move 11 into EAX, which is hex B, which is the value of exec BE. Now we're going to use the stack. So we're going to push onto the stack the string slash BIN slash SH, which is zero, or the bytes. But remember, right, bytes go, or strings go up, right? They're read from the first string up. But when we push things onto the stack, we're going to be pushing them on high to low. So we have to push the string onto the stack in reverse order. And we're going to use that. So basically, we're going to want to push slash sh0 and then push slash bin, yes, slash bin and then slash h0, sh0. 
right? So this is four bytes, so we can do this with one push operation. So we have to do it in reverse order, so we're going to push uh, zero at h s slash, and then we want to push slash bin onto the stack. So we're going to push uh, n i b slash, and so now sh points to the string, the null terminated string slash bin slash sh. So now we're going to move the stack pointer to ebx. So now we've introduced that bin sh into the program. Right? So this was just to get that string into memory and get the address into ebx. Right? But now we have to create the argv parameters. So we're first going to push 0 and then push ebx, where ebx now controls that address higher up on the stack of where slash bin slash sh live. And then we move the stack pointer into ecx. And then we move 0 to edx. And finally, we're all done. So we can call our exec uh, ve. So now we can call in 80. And in case this didn't work, we can clean up and call exit. So questions on this? So everybody believes that wherever this executes, it's going to be, it's going to work, no matter where in what address this starts executing at. Yeah. You basically, the kernel tried to access that memory location, right, 804, whatever, whatever. Uh, either it was not mapped, in which case it failed, or it was some string, some weird string, and then it tried to find a command and failed that way. So it was a command that existed. What is the state call? Is that what you mean? Uh, it's kernel space, right? So you as the user should cause the kernel to site call. So it'll just return the error message. If we had tried to dereference that memory, it would have given us an error. But because we're just passing, we just passed a value to the kernel. Okay. So you'd like to, to do the syscall itself. And you're exactly. Okay. Yes, because it's a syscall, right? The kernel handles everything. So yeah, it's not it's not going to kill your program because your program didn't dereference memory that didn't exist, right? The kernel did on your behalf, kind of. Okay. So we want to do our very first sanity check, right, by compiling this. So we compile this. We run it, and we get our shell. Yay, great success. Okay. Now we want to look at it again, right? So we want to take the object dump so we can look at the output here. And then we want to see, so are there any hard-coded references in here? No, right? We're pushing constant values onto the stack. Uh, we're moving things around. Yeah, no hard-coded value, right? Wherever Whenever this code starts to execute, no matter where it exists or what process it exists in, right, as long as there is a stack that it can push things onto, then we're good. Right? That's a pretty safe bet because your program has to have programs have to have stacks, right? That's kind of the standard way of doing this. Okay, so now let's test this shell code. So we put the shell code into the buffer. Uh, we're gonna set this function pointer to be the shell code. We're going to execute it. And so we're going to compile this with an executable stack. And we we'll run it, and we see that, yay, it gets us what we expect, which was the same thing as our original one. But what's the problem? So can we use this? We could. We can use this. What could be one problem? What are most uh, buffers composed of? I say buffers. Like, what, what are programmers using buffers for? Just holding intermediate values. I heard a lot of, yeah. Character strings. Character strings, right? They're strings. What's a character string in C? A bunch of bytes. Null terminated, right? So if we wanted to trick the program into thinking this was a string, what would we have any problems? Mm. Yeah, there's nulls inside of it, right? So if we try to do a string copy from this into a buffer, mm. right, it's going to read B80B0 and then stop and only copy those two bytes over, right? And some, as we saw with some of the um, 
overflowing functions like the scanf or gets, I think, they'll also stop with a new line. Right? So we want to make sure there's also no new lines in our shell code. Um, so I won't go over this. It's actually a lot of fun. And there's a whole, you know, this is x86, right? So it's uh, completely, you can do whatever you want with it, right? It's uh, Turing complete. So you can, uh, there's all kinds of shell code. You can write shell code that looks like ASCII characters. Uh, you can write shell code that doesn't use, I don't know, any other random weird characters. Or that you can write shell code that has a very specific checksum too. Uh, maybe you have to pass some weird checksum thing. Um, so I'll share with you. So this is um, some shell code. Where am I going? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is some shell code I wrote by tweaking that original program, right? So you always want to start with something that works, and then you want to tweak it to try to uh, eliminate all the null bytes from the resulting output. So it uses some tricks, right? So we can see that right here, well, this, this first null bytes comes from here, right? Moving B into EAX. Well, so what can we assume is inside EAX when we first start our shell code? Is it going to be zero? It's going to be one. It's going to be two, three, four, five. I'll stop me before I get to two to three, two. Could be anything, right? I mean, our code, we're trying to get the program to execute our code. We have no idea what the state of the registers are at this point. So pretty much the first trick we're going to use is before we use a register, we need to clear it, right? We need to set it to some known value. So what happens when you XOR a number with itself? Zero. Zero. Yeah, so we can use that trick. And it turns out that the XOR, EAX, EAX, doesn't have any null bytes in it. So it's going to clear the EAX register. Uh, I'm going to use another trick, but I'm going to do it later. So now I have a, a, a register that I know is zero. Eventually, the value 11 has to be in this register, EAX. Uh, we're going to wait to see how that gets in there. So then I'm going to push EAX onto the stack. All right, so what's that going to push onto the stack? Zeros. Zeros, right? So this is going to be the null termination of slash bin slash sh. Right? So if we look at this, we can see the constant value that we're pushing is actually directly in the shell code, right? So by pushing that zero in here, that's causing a zero byte to be in our resulting shell code. So I'm going to say, OK, let's not include that in here. Let's push that zero onto there. And then we're going to use a weird trick. Oh, the comment's not correct. But what we're going to do is, oh, is there anywhere I can write? OK, we'll just show you. Um, so we're going to use a trick that if we do, so we want eight bytes, right? Because we want this to be four bytes and then four bytes. So we've been pushing slash bin slash sh0. So I've already pushed the 0. But now I have an extra byte, right, that I don't know what it is. But if I preface this string with a slash, it'll be slash slash bin slash sh0, right? And to the operating system, slash slash is the same thing, right? I mean, you can do this as many times as you want. You can do ls slash, 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 and it will just canonicalize that as one slash. I guess I could even index up. Anyways, that's not important. Um, so that's what's here. So it's uh, backwards. It's like sh slash n uh, i b slash slash. So that's what we're pushing onto there. Now we do exactly what we did. So we move the stack pointer into the base pointer. And we can look at our original one and see uh, stack pointer into EBX. No zeros here. Uh, there's a zero here, right? So we're pushing zero onto the stack, constant zero. But what do we already have that's zero? EAX, right? Yeah, we can just push EAX. So we can push EAX. Then we can push EBX, that should be fine. 
Uh, move the stack pointer into the ECX. Uh, move EAX into EDX again, right? Because we had uh, moved zero into EDX, but we ha already have zero in EAX, so we move zero into there. So we need to call the int 80, but we never set B into EAX. So one thing we could do is we could just like, you could call add a bunch of times, like 11 times you could just add, add or increment, I think there's an increment function, right? So just increment EAX 11 times. Um, the other trick we can use, remember when we talked way back about the size of the registers in EAX, right? So EAX was the full 32 bits. And so what was like the 16 bits AX? And then you would split that up into AH, which is the high, and AL, which is the low. So what you can do is you can reference AL. So now this byte is only, instead of here, where we're moving along, right? we need to move 0000000B into register EAX. Now we're just moving byte 0B into AL, the lower eight bits of EAX. But we know, what do we know about the rest of EAX? Zero. zero. Yeah, so this will work. Uh, so we move 11 into there, and then we call our hand 80, and then here we set EAX uh, to 1, and then we set EVX to 0, and we call hand 80 again. So now we can compile this run it, and we get a shell. Yay. So then we can test it to make sure that it works. And we will get, hopefully, the same thing. Yes. Cool. All right. But, warning. So this is something you got to do yourself. So I messed up some bytes on this, these bytes here. So I want you to do this on your own because it's really fun. Get your own shell code. Uh, there's also other websites you can get it from, but this is cooler, doing it by hand. Okay, so now we know, okay, we know how to create, craft that code, right? We need to get, right, so that buffer that we have, that shellcode we just created, we know if we start executing exactly at the start of that shellcode, we will get a shell, right? Uh, so what we want to do is overflow we want to get the instruction pointer to point to the start of this buffer. And so what we're going to do in general to overflow, we're going to overflow with first the shellcode, and then the address of that shellcode repeatedly. So this will look kind of like, so we have our buffer here, we have the base pointer, we have the save EIP, and then we have other things on the stack. So we overflow it right with a long string where first we have our shellcode, and then we overflow with that address of the buffer that we want it to go to. So that way when that ret instruction happens, right, whatever's inside here is taken as an address and we jump to it and start executing right at the shellcode. The problem is, is that in most cases, this address is not exactly known at runtime, right? As we saw, the environment can change the stack because this address of this buffer is on the stack. Um, and you have to essentially guess it, and your guess must be incredibly precise because you have to start executing on that first byte, right? Otherwise, if we execute it anywhere below, it's gonna fail, and if we execute anywhere above, it's gonna fail too. So one thing you can do is to use GDB to try to get the address of that stack inside GDB, and that'll give you at least a good target to shoot for. Um, and if you basically have the same environment and you know the size of the command line parameters, you can guess you know, roughly the size of the, the address of the stack. Uh, you also have to guess that offset. But there's a very cool technique called a NOP sled. So a NOP means a no op. And so the idea is, well, instead of having to execute directly at that very starting byte of your shellcode, if we use a series of no ops, so in x86, a no op is hex 90. So hex 90 just means do nothing. And so what you do is you first add a bunch of no ops to the start of your. Um, so what you're going to do when you do your overflow, you're going to overflow first with some no ops, and then your shellcode, and then the 
buffer address. But now, instead of having to be precisely right at the start of your shell code, if the if the if uh, you jump anywhere inside this knock, right, it'll just do nothing, 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 nothing all the way to your shell code and then start executing your shell code. So in here, you're essentially increasing your chances of hitting your shell code by doing this. And so yeah, as long as you get it somewhere within that knock, then you're fine. Okay, we want to exploit this following program. So this is a, a simple vulnerable function that we're calling. We're passing in argv1. Who controls argv1? User. Us, uh, so the user, yeah. So we're copying that into copy, right, which is a buffer that's allocated on the stack that's only 512 bytes. Um, all that we know really is that uh, anytime a string that's bigger than 512 characters is passed, then we get a seg fault. So I'll kind of just walk you through it, but you should think about how you would go about doing this. So we first, so these are the command line parameters you have to use to compile uh, these programs because these are so complicated. Also, on our server, ASLR is disabled. If you do this on your server, you'll have ASLR enabled. So uh, let me know, I can send you, there's a little command you can do to disable ASLR only for a certain task session. So then we run this, this runs fine. Right? But we need to get 512 characters into there. So do you want to just like type out 512 A's? No, it's terrible. Don't do that. Use an awesome use command substitution. So the backticks here, right, is going to take the output of that program and pass it in as that argv parameter. So python-c means here's a Python program on the command line. Um, and then the double quotes means inside this is a Python program. So this prints out. Uh, a times 512, right? So the Python program is going to give us 512 capital A's, and then that's going to be passed as argv1 to this vulnerable function. And so we get a seg fault, right? So this is our first indication that this is a buffer overflow. But we want to test this, right? So we want to run it in GDB to see, did we actually control the instruction pointer? So inside GDB, we're going to run it. And inside GDB, you can run it with the same parameters, which is very handy. So you can do R is for run, and then you can run it with the backticks here. And we'll see that when it runs, it'll say that it got a seg fault, and it'll say that it tried to start executing 41, 41, 41, 41. Right? This is where we are. This is golden. Um, so now I'm going to set a breakpoint in the vulnerable function, because I want to see where is that buffer. right? Where does that buffer live? Because I need to know how to jump into that buffer. <coughs> So it's going to set a breakpoint. I'm going to run it. Once it hits that breakpoint, I'm going to print out the address of copy. So copy was my buffer on the stack. It's going to tell me that it's at FFFFCE0C. So then I want to try to craft my exploit. So I'm going to run it, right, A dot out. I'm going to run it with, uh, I'm, in this case, I'm going to do 400 of this hex of NOPS, 400 bytes of NOPS. <coughs> followed by my shell code, followed by, what, so why is my, I thought my address was FFFFCE0C. Yes. Endianness, endianness. You're always going to have the addresses backwards, in byte order backwards. So I'm going to try to overflow this. So if I'm successful, I want it to jump and start executing at memory address FFFFCE0C. So this will seg fault. Yes? Just to clarify, that's not true on Uh, it's true for everything. True for everything. Yes, because bytes are writing up. When you do string copy, you're writing bytes up the stack, and then when it's interpreting four bytes as an int, it reads the was it the highest byte as the first, the most significant, <coughs> where you wrote the least significant byte first. side effect of how the overflow happens. It's not like copying this address there. Okay, so then we want to say, okay, well, that should have, we think that should have worked, so let's use GDB to find out why. Uh, we're going to set a breakpoint at vulnerable function. Uh, we're going to run it again with this exact same input now, right? Because now we want to know, okay, how did that, how did that thing change um, with this input? So, we print out the address of copy, and we see that it moved a bunch, right? FF, FF, F, 
uh, C657. So this was CE0C, right? It makes sense because we doubled our the data that we sent here, right? We're sending 500 plus the length of shellcode plus another 512 bytes, when before we were just sending 512. So this makes sense, right? Because on the stack, the argv actual parameters are stored, so that shifts the starting stack location down. <coughs> Then we say, okay, what happens, let's run this program again, but change this address here to this C657. So should this work? Because I've changed this address that I'm dubbing you now to the address of copy. Yeah, this should work, right? It's working in GDB, so we don't get any additional privileges, right, because we're executing with our privileges. Yes, but it doesn't work. But what is what is this? Um, so this memory address, right? How does this look? It looks kind of close, right? F, there's an FF, a C6, and a 5C, and we passed in FF, FF, C6, 5C, but it's not in the right order, right? And so this is because Right? We have to hit that address. We have to hit those exact four bytes exactly in the right order. Otherwise, if we're offset, right, so we're copying the same thing over and over again. So if we're offset, then the bytes are going to be all mixed up. Uh, so then we have to add, basically, I like to add padding after my shell code to pad out all the rest of my addresses. So I try with just one A to offset them by one based on where they were. Uh, I would see it received a seg fault, but we can see it actually is receiving a different address. Uh, do it again with two A's. We'll see it almost got there. And then finally we can do it with another one. And we can see that this process is executing a new program bin bash, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, then I'm just going to, I got to finish this. So let's just run through here. So then we try this. So we say, yes, we've got something that almost works, right? It works in GDB. So we run it here. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? The environment variables, right? GDB sets up environment variables. It changes the environment. So then we got to think, okay, gosh, well, I have 400 bytes of shellcode, right? And I know that if the environment's only getting bigger from GDB, right, that means I should try farther up the stack. I have to cheat ahead. Yes, farther up the stack, which means you can increase this number, right? So does it make sense to just increase to do like 5B? No, right? Because we have a 400 byte window. So I would try incrementing uh, this here, right? Which is going to be 256 bytes up. So change this to 6C7. Uh, run that, and we get our shell. So it just happened to be there. I would keep trying that, right? Just, just try. You can write a script that just tries every 256 bytes. Cool. All right. So that is stack overflows, shell code, pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, everything from here on out is like refinements of that technique. So looking at different things, like what happens if we have small buffers? Um, actually, let's go over this very quickly because it could help. Uh, so a buffer could be too small to contain your shellcode, right? Uh, but we can control the environment, right? Locally, we can execute processes locally. So we can put the map plus the shellcode into an environment variable. Then when we execute that program, we know that environment variable is going to be copied to its address space. So this means we only have to overflow the address of this environment variable. So the big advantage is your not can be as big as you want it to be, right? I, there's probably some limit to environment variables, but your not can be very, very large, your not sled. Uh, so this actually is very useful for doing homework stuff. So, all right, cool. Thanks for bringing this up.